And hello, everybody. It is Tom Chenault, and it's the Network Marketing Leadership Show. We are going to have an unbelievable show for you today. We've got the only, only guy I know that is like the coolest guy I know. And I can't wait to tell you about him because he's a maniac. But I forgot because Adrian wasn't, uh, I, he wasn't here last week. Uh, I actually forgot Adrian was my son. So he's actually with me today. And he was on vacation. He went to Aruba or something. And now he's back. Where'd you go? Steamboat Springs. Oh, that's close. Yeah. All right. How'd it go? Was it fun? It was so good. Are you glad to be back? Very, very glad. And who gave you the hookup for the hotel when your entire travel plans went to hell in a handbag? <laughs> Turns out all, all members of your family need passports, not just four out of five does not count on the uh, international travel front. And we learned that the hard way. So thank God for my dear old dad. Contact mapper that I am. I picked up the phone. Five seconds later, he had a suite in a hotel that would make you cry in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. I am telling you, all of you need to know how to monetize your database with karma, with spirituality, with everything. And one of the best guys you're ever going to meet in your life is my buddy, John Register. And you're looking at him right here. And he's significantly older than the first time I met him. But I ran into him in an airport and he was sitting there and he had an aura about him that literally pulled me across the room. And I go, who is this guy? And I walk over to him and I just said, who are you? And he told me his story. And I have been in love with him ever since. At that point, he had a wife and two small kids. He was working down in Colorado Springs. He was doing gigantic things even back then. And he has graduated. So I'm going to let you, he's going to tell his story a little bit, but you just have never met a guy in your life that's overcome it like John Register out of the University of Arkansas. Go How are you, John? <laughs> oh my gosh. Tom, Adrian, it's so wonderful to be on the show with you all. It's great to see you. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you had dear old dad there, Adrian. Thank <laughs> you, God, man. You I never was... stopped being parents for some reason. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, very honored to be on the show. Thank you. Um, I don't know where you want to start. You want to start in the story? or I want to know... start. First of all, I want yeah. to tell everybody when I met him, he was his side hustle because he loved his little kid so much. It was so adorable. He had one of those popcorn machines. You know, where you remember that? Do you still have that thing? No, we, we had uh, we had popcorn. We also, we the bigger thing we did was funnel cakes. Yeah. And was that just fun or was it, did you ever make any money on it? Yeah, we, we actually started it as a, <laughs> so backstory on that. I used to work for the United States Army. I was a soldier. Then I started, when I started working for them, and they put me through this um, this course, which was an MWR, Morale, Wealth, and Recreation course. Uh, and MWR actually operates as a for-profit business inside of the military. No one knows this stuff. So they operate hotels. They operate um, uh, kind of the one-armed bandits and everything. And that cash profit, what at that time was about $1.3 billion annual sales. That's making money. So we call this non-appropriative fund dollars. Right. Or soldier dollars. Okay. So from, from that, they want to know how to manage it. So I went to this, this management course on this stuff. Um, and, and we had to do a break even analysis and the break even analysis. I, I took what I only knew when I used to run for the university of Arkansas, we went to the pin relays and outside the gate, of the pin relays, you got these great big funnel cakes. So I said, I love those things. Let me see what the break even analysis on it. And when I saw the profit margin, after I figured out how to do it, I was like, oh my gosh, let's do this. So Alice and I, we started a funnel cake business and we brought these fryers from this regular conventional household fryers from the, the PX, the Post Exchange. And we went out to the park and we had all these fryers out there. We had a line a mile long and we were cooking grease cakes. They wow. were horrible. They were the worst thing ever. And we had a, a line a mile long. Wow. <laughs> so I said, well, let's let's do this for real. So, you know, back in the old days when you got to float a check, I floated a check, got a big old fryer, and I and 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 I didn't realize that propane and propane and regular gas were different. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm out with this big old fryer. I can't get the thing started. I'm about to go to jail because I floated this check <laughs> and eventually get the fryer working. And um I, I was I was all in for like 3800 bucks. And after two days, we made like seven grand. Oh, wow. Didn't go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. But that's what you have to do. You have to hustle, don't you? 
<laughs> you got to hustle. Yeah. You got to hustle. And so it, was, it was great. You were a four-time All-American at University of Arkansas. Unbelievable track guy. Headed to unbelievable fame, military. Everything was going your way. Yeah. And what the heck happened? So, yeah. I'm going to finish that funnel cake story. So now we, oh we my teach God, it as a business. <laughs> we teach it as a business. So I, I go down to Harrison High School now. It's in District 2, Colorado Springs. And we would hire um, kids to go work the business. I would make them do the break-even analysis. I would make them do how to... Um, you know, find your cost, uh, cost analysis, all those things they did. And then I would pay them 15 bucks an hour. And after the night was over, I would give them a bonus of about 500 bucks. <laughs> wow. And it, it was worked. awesome. It's great. And they're like, oh my gosh, this eyes this big. I'm going out getting Jordans, you know? So that was, <laughs> so we, we had them do all that stuff to actually show how you can, it, it's, it's on you to make that the business actually work. Okay. So now, that's all. That's story. Right. I interrupted you, and I'm so sorry. And everybody in the comment is being very, very mean to me. Keep going. <laughs> no, I love this. Ron Henley's great story. Well, there it is. Oh, it is. is. Ignore them. Story. Those people are all drunk. But wait, there's more. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. Wait, there's more. <laughs> so at, at 5.29 in the afternoon, like you said, Tom, I was one of the world's fastest hurdlers, eighth fastest in the, in the country, in the United States, top 20 in the world. Uh, USA Track and Field News had just said, I'm the one to watch, would be one to watch for the 1996 Olympic Games. 400 meter hurdles one time around the track, over 35 um, of, of 10 barriers, spaced 35 meters apart. I'm approaching each hurdle at about 8.9 meters a second. <laughs> wow. so, so somebody put that in the chat. How fast is that? So as, as, um, as I'm running, right, uh, the wind is blowing hard in Hayes, Kansas. I'm having problems with my steps. Now I'm on, I'm in the military. I'm on my way to officer candidate school. That's kind of my next position. I'm going to be a lifer. I love I love it. Combat veteran. And so I'm like saluting the flag. It's, it's everything's going gravy, and the wind's blowing really hard, and I'm having trouble with my steps. The right leg's coming up. The left leg's coming up. And sometimes in hurdles, as in life, we just want things to stay the same. But because of this moment in time, it's not. And I've got to figure it out before the, I have this race the next day. So I jump in the blocks. I do my one last proverbial pass. My right leg leads over the first hurdle. I'm on second hurdle. Right leg leads again. I'm still on. And I feel that Kansas wind really push against me. But I'm, I'm determined. I push back against the Kansas wind. I realize about six steps out, I'm going to be short. And as I'm approaching the hurdle, I'm looking in the chat. It's 19 miles an hour, about 19 and a half miles an hour. There you go. 19.9. There that's it, uh, Jason. Thanks for putting that there. Awesome. You yeah. just got in under the wire. Under the wire, baby. Um, so, uh, I, 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 I'm short. So I have to take the hurdle with my left leg off the right leg. I go, I cross the hurdle with my left leg. When I land, the leg snaps in half. It hyperextends. And when I fall forward, the, the left leg is now canted across my right leg. The, um, my foot is touching the black surface of the clat of, of the track. And as you can, as you can imagine, you know, life is, has now shifted. It has changed. Uh, in fact, a, a second lieutenant took uh, Michelle Dickens took nine pictures that day, and I, you know, I, I usually post every once in a while the picture of that injury, so we can see what our what the, what the second worst day of my life was uh, for for that time, and and in that moment, you know, I'm trying to identify, you know, what what do I need to do, and my brain was just like, just get up, just 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 push yourself up, get yourself up, John. And that was not going to happen. I was wheeled off, whisked off to Hayes Medical Center. A doctor comes in. Got this white lab coat on, stethoscope around his neck. He looks at me, takes one look at my crooked leg that looks like the letter L. Yes, absolutely, Ron, destiny moment. And he says, I'm going to have to fix that. So he bears down that crooked leg and says, we're going to do this on three. One, <laughs> pat, spots my leg, you know, my leg balloons up, I pass out. And then seven days later, after all these surgeries, I'm medevac to w Wichita, Kansas. My wife is in the room. My parents in the room. My son, John Jr., is playing with a little toy train at the bottom of the foot of the bed. And I'm in the most pain that I've ever been in in my life, or at least up until that point. And Dr. Randy Mullins, the, the attending physician, says, you know, John, you got a tough choice to make. Keep your leg, use a walker or a wheelchair for the rest of your life. Amputate the leg, use a prosthetic for the rest of your life. Well, what kind of choice is that? So I look back at Dr. Mullins and I know what the pain that I'm in. I just want, in my mail, the Dr. Reason says, just get rid of the leg, get rid of the pain. 
And so I looked back at him and said, I, I know it has to be amputated. And he immediately goes into work. Two nights later, I wake up 11 o'clock at night. Uh, it's a little black and white clock there at the back of the room spinning. And, and I'm in more pain than my male deductive reasoning had reasoned. Yeah. And I just wanted something to knock it out. So there's a morphine drip button over, you know, this morphine drip button. And I wanted to knock it out. So I, but I too weak to roll over to depress that button. And I can see the nurse's aid stage. So I'll just get, I'll just get their attention. So I want to call out to them, but the, the tubes that were down my throat made the sound too inaudible to get their attention. So there I'm there laying in that bed for the next eight hours with my dangerous thoughts. Who am I now? What's my identity? Will my wife Alice still stick around? Will, will my son still see, see me and value me as his father? Do I still have a job in the military? Can I support my family? I mean, my Olympic dreams are over. And at... Eight o'clock, Dr. Mullins comes back in the room, looks at me, sees I've done a 180 degree shift. And he immediately calls my wife, Alice, who's taking me out, uh, to, who, who's trying to manage me herself, her mother-in-law. She's just been fired from her job seven o'clock that morning because she's been too gone away too long to care for me. And she comes over, they get me into a wheelchair with me out to an inaccessible playground where I'm parked there watching my wife and my son play on the swing set. And I couldn't push myself out of that chair. It's the first time I felt devalued, dejected, and disabled. Started crying, lost it. E everything was just pouring out of me. Alice sees me struggling, comes running over, says, you know what, John? We're going to get through this together. It's just our new normal. And when she spoke those words, she really based on my entire existence. She undergird me. And I began to think about it. And as John Jr. jumps off the swing, he's five and a half year old legs come running over to me. Hey, mom, dad, you see my big jump? You see my big jump? He jumps in between myself and Alice. And I realized in that moment that he had just jumped off that swing. He just validated me as his father. And he created his new normal. And that began to be my rallying cry from that point forward on. Oh, my gosh. That's the most beautiful thing. Everybody. All of you, mm. you think you got problems? Think about that day in Hayes, Kansas. I tried to fly an airplane into Hayes and the wind was blowing 70 miles an hour. And I had to turn base and it blew me all the way to Colorado. And I had to <laughs> practice. It was terrible. And I landed almost standing still because it was going 70 miles an hour. That's what he was up against. And we're going to take a break right now. But we're going to come back and talk about what the other side because this guy is a true American hero. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching so far. We'll be right back. Genesis Communication Network. Speechless. <laughs> Speechless. <laughs> I yeah. I, you know, and I knew half. I knew half that story already, and I'm still speechless. But I thinking mm -hmm. about that you were getting ready to go to OCS, and that you know all of that just to go down in one fell swoop just I, I i truly can't imagine i think i think we can it's 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 we all went through it we all went through an amputation in COVID. oh yeah no shit but we're in the commercial so i can cuss <laughs> <laughs> yeah true story yeah that was yeah. In we, we all went through it we want we went through it what i call a cerebral amputation yeah yeah you're right. Every, we, we wanted things back that we could no longer get back. You're right. We want to talk about that in this body of the show because we go out on 550 radio stations and people need to hear that little point right there. Yep. So throw a commercial at them real quick. John, so here's here's my question for you about connections. How, you know, you're suddenly in this space of going from being Superman to suddenly being very needy and very vulnerable. How did connection and people help you through that time and how important was that for you yeah you have to rely on the connections it's, it's, you rely on the relationships that you have built all in that point in time you don't get the connections in the time of the moment you find out who your connections actually are yeah. that's they those are the ones that rise to the top you know my wife and i we were struggling during that time you know i was a geographical bachelor because i was i was stationed in germany i didn't have command sponsorship that's why she couldn't be with me when I was stationed in Germany. Uh, we tried to make it work and her coming over, but I mean, uh, she couldn't get a license, a driver's license. And then we're so far from the base and we're living in this barn thing. 
So it was really tough. And so we, she went back to start working. And during that time, you know, she's kind of got her life going. I got my life going. Uh, and so that moment really solidified for us. We found out just how much we desired each other because the fear wasn't me. You know, when I was staying in the hospital bed, uh, her her leaving me, that was that wasn't my fear. The fear was, am I still desirable? Yeah. Do people still want me? Am I still valuable? And if I'm not, what does that say? How do I handle that? The the ego side, right? Um, that the military no longer wants you. You're not you're not deployable. You're not in the deployed deployable status. How do I deal with that? And that's where people don't want to go. You know, we don't want to go into that space of under talking about the true fear that's behind the fear we're facing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, you have, you find out, you find out who your real friends are. You find out, you know, you, there's a gut check that even happens in that moment of who do I, who do I call on? Who do I think are those people? And then do they rise to the occasion? And that's just so, so important, you know, what, no matter where we are, no matter how, you know, whether it's something that dramatic, whether it's, you know, so I, I had something happen what Friday, Saturday night. And I what went from totally normal to, I got a big problem on my hands and you knowing who you can call in those moments right. is really important. And, and there's a, there's so few of us there, there's, there's a less and less people that I think have the answer to who I would call in that moment. So that's really important. All right. We're going to come back to the main show and I don't even, yeah, we're just going to go back. Sure. <laughs> and welcome back. This is the contact mapping sponsored network marketing leadership show. So go to contactmapping.com right now and make sure you dial in and get that free app for staying connected to people. I've stayed connected to John Register. He's got to be creeped out because, man, I've been stalking him for a decade at least ever since the day I met him. We were talking about what happened to him and what he's gone through. And it's just absolutely brought me to my knees. I have a major, major handicap called addiction, a terribly drunk alcoholic that I was able to turn around and turn it into my biggest asset. And I thought that was a big thing but not nearly, doesn't even pale in comparison or pales in comparison. I don't know what the heck that means. Here's the deal. John Register fought through it and turned it around. And what he's doing with his life now is literally unbelievable. So back to you. This is a short segment, John. So just fire it up and keep telling this story because these people have got to understand you might be down, but you are never out, right? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right, and and I would say you as well. I mean, you that you you sharing that story, you 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 licked it, you you did it right. So you you pushed to that side, and and so we all have those struggles, we all have those challenges. For me, with the mindset shift, it was Alice's words of this is our this is our just our new normal. Yeah. I began to use it as a mindset that was it's a place right to a mind site where I desired to be. So I began to see what was possible. And then kind of some of the keynote addressing, what I do is I say, this is a redefining moment. The redefining moment is when we begin to think about a, a glimpse of something that can actually get us over the hump. I say, when our truth outweighs our fear, we will commit to a courageous life. So that's that's the thing. If, most of the time, our fear is over our truth, so we never commit. We always are... are beholden to the opinions of others or what society has dictated to us. And that drives even more of our fears. But when we jump and the jump is your jump, the jump is our jump. Then we get over to the other side of this rebirth and the, and if we don't commit to the jump, we don't live a life of regret. We live a life of justification. I begin justifying why I was too un, not courageous enough to make the jump. So we get over to the rebirth side and it's actually harder than we anticipated because that's where the real work begins. I now have to unlearn some things that were learned uh, maybe wrongly in my life. And if I'm unwilling to do that, I find myself back in fear. And I, I question whether a person's made the jump before. But for me, I had to, I, it wasn't that I was going to go win a silver medal at the, the, the Paralympic Games. For me, it was, how can I stand up on my leg for 15 seconds? 
30 seconds, a minute, and then manipulate a wheelchair to get to my prosthetic appointments, put on an artificial leg and walk between the parallel bars, get a four bar walker to walk around the hospital, walker to crutches, crutches to cane, cane to free walking, free walking to, to swimming, swimming to running, running to jumping, and then to a silver medal, <sighs> right? Six and a half years that took. And we want it right now. We want a Burger King. We just want, you know, uh, we got we we had the horrible thing with with, uh, with the, the murder of George Floyd, and then we talk about race relations, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and say, how can we can't just get over this? Because we got to unlearn some things. Was it, you know, we, let, let's go visceral, right? Let's talk about um, July Fourth. Was everybody liberated on July Fourth, or did that happen? And what we're learning now on Juneteenth. And we have these conversations. If I don't agree with that, why? What is causing me to not look at the historical context versus what I might have been told by others or society? I have to unlearn it and not to learn it over again. That is a, it's, it's a very hard position to be in. But if you're willing to commit to it six and a half years later and you're willing to do the work, then you get to a point of, um, the resolve. I'm now resolute. I know exactly who I am and how I'm showing up. I've done the work. I've done the reading. I've done the research. And no longer am I going back to what you think I should be. No, you need to catch up to where I am. And you begin to become an advocate in that space and moment. So in my life, I started swimming for physical therapy. I got so fast in the water that I um, that I fluked up, messed up, and actually made the Paralympic swim team 27 months post amputation. I saw athletes running and jumping on the uh, on the on the on the track, <laughs> and I had said I got to get one of those things made. Uh, and I had a leg made for running. And four years later, I went to Sydney, Australia, and won the Paralympic silver medal in the long jump, setting the American record in the process. <clears throat> you know, and and in that process, like again, it's it's six, it's six years. A reporter asked me. You know, after that time, she says, you know, John, I saw you I saw you run with Carl Lewis and jump with, against Carl Lewis and run with uh, Michael Johnson in the Southwest Conference. And I said, yeah. And she said, do you think with artificial limb technology, could you do the same thing again? And I looked at her and I said, wow, that's a great question. I said, maybe. Well, I, no, I don't think so. Not with our, not with the way I'm running right now. However, maybe your question should be if God forbid Carl Lewis or Michael Johnson lost a limb. Could they run as fast or jump as far as I do? Wow. Catch up. Unbelievable. All right, let's take another break. This is a longer commercial. This is going to be worth your time. Be sure to stick around. This guy is unbelievable. My good friend, John Register. Here we come. That's cool. Yeah. You need to get your father-in-law. Her, His father. Uh, what? Tell him about your brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Both. The, so uh, my wife's family is multi-generational, all military, uh, air force, our, uh, my father-in-law was a Marine. Both of my yep. brothers are active duty in the army. Uh, one stationed in, uh, Nebraska ones up, it just transferred and took over a battalion in, in Fairbanks, Alaska. And, uh, and actually my, my oldest brother-in-law, John listens to the show. And so he's going to be, I, I can't figure out why he listens to the show most of the time. Cause I feel like it has very little to do with him. So he's going to be very pleasantly surprised when he hears this one and, and really surprised, are really honored by you. So John, shout out to you, man, for suffering through most of my podcast. This is, uh, this one is way more up your alley. So thank you, John register. You're amazing, man. No worries. I, I love being on. I love, love talking to you all, you all guys. Yeah. It's and what the most important thing that you've done is fought through it, stayed connected with people, and every day is an effort to make the world a better place hmm. and getting people to see your vision and do just that. Right, John? Yeah, I, th I think that's, you know, we, 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 we look at the end state. I look at the end state of life and, you know, I want to hear my God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So then how do I do that? You know, uh, it, it's, it's how I show up for individuals. And it's I'm not I'm not going to show up for you the way that you may need me to show up for you because I, I can't be you. And I think that too many times we're trying to be somebody else instead of being ourselves. Yeah. And that gets us into trouble because I'm always looking at somebody else's life and say, oh, man, I wish I had that. But we don't know their struggle of what they've been through. So be honor who you are and show up as your full authentic self, as we say over and over again. And just because something is overused, like authentic self doesn't mean that you shouldn't be showing up as your full authentic self. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. Yeah. <laughs>
what a, what a crazy turn of the world that those words have become so normalized that they're overused. And yet I think still, there's still so much work left to do in the actual doing of that. But it's, it's pretty crazy that that's, that that's so much the case. Yeah. When you, when you work, you know, I know, I know you do a ton of public speaking when you're mentoring people and trying to get them to step into that. What do you think is what moves people to, to get past the facade and into being who they really are? Yeah, I, th I think one is is actually seeing it modeled before them, right? We gravitate to some pe people and we say, who do I gravitate to? Why do I gravitate to that person? Because we perceive them to be an anchor or a solid. They're, 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 ro they're a rock to us. And they we desire something of what of what they they have in their essence, not of, you know, maybe their status, but the, kind of the, their, their essence. And they're, they're a grounding force. Many people um, follow, just follow the crowd and we, we can just fall into that trap as well. So if you think about, you know, another one of the words that has been thrown out there so much is uncertainty. Oh, my gosh, we're living in such uncertain times. So I always ask the question, well, when do we ever have certainty? Yeah. If we would have certainty, we would have been certainly not been in this situation. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that that's just the, you know, we never had it and we never will have certainty. What we do have is we can put into place. And I think this is what helps individuals, athletes, you know, successful business personnel, whatever you define success as, is what rituals have we put in place? And you're like your contact mapping, right? What rituals have we put in place that turn into a rhythm that elevate us to a rise that create the results that we desire? How do we keep that consistent? Because in new normal, another overused term, but I've been using it for 25 years. So forget everybody else. I'm still yeah, using the term. It first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been using it. So new, when you break it down, people have been using it, you know, uh, in, in two different ways. One has been, man, I can't wait till things get back to normal. That's one way. The second way they've been using it, well, I guess this is just our new normal. It's a point of destination. Well, if new means no prior point of reference, then why are we trying to use something old to 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 put into something new in order to move uh, to more, move a new thought? And then normal is the everyday typical occurrence of a thought or an action. Again, the rituals that we put in place. So the new normal is not a destination at all. It's, it's only a plateau by which we grow. It's like the Olympic model of sidious altius fortius, the Latin words for swifter, higher, stronger. Those words haven't, or they're not written in, in the superlative of the word. It's not swiftest, highest, or strongest. They have an ER stem ending, which means we can be the swiftest today, but swifter tomorrow. We can jump the highest today, jump higher tomorrow. We can lift the heaviest weight today, lift heavier weight tomorrow. Your contacts, your resources, your the people that you're trying to develop relationships with are at one level today. They can be greater tomorrow through the systems that you put in place. Whew. All right. That was an unbelievable break. You know, the commercials today are actually better than the show. So now you have to watch the whole thing again. All right. This is contactmapping.com. Here we go. And we're back. It's the Network Marketing Leadership Show. We've got John Register. We are transfixed. We have lost all control of the show because the guy, holy mackerel, how'd you get so smart? Were you, did you just study as you laid in the bed recuperating? Or That's funny. <laughs> That's the truth. Well, John, this is so good. I watched your interview with Carl Mecklenburg, the unbelievable Pro Bowl linebacker from the Denver Broncos. And I also watched your TED Talk. And those of you watching this show and listening to this show, if you do anything today, go to LinkedIn or go on the internet and just Google John and jump in his life because this guy is affecting change. And during the break, we talked about COVID a little bit. And it was an interesting commentary that he had on that, that I wanna bring back and talk about that a little harder because COVID was an event, an epic event in the lives of the world, wasn't it, John? That yes. was similar to what you went through. Yeah, you know, people will always challenge and say, you know, thanks for bringing that back up, Tom. You know, people will always challenge and say, uh, Things that other people say. You know, we're talking during the break about uncertain times. Well, when do we ever have certainty? The other thing that I, I liken it to is people say, well, I, I've never been through something that you went through. I never had an amputation. I said, well, yes, you did. Because one of the things I realized with an amputation is had to overcome the amputation, I'd have my leg back. Well, I don't. During COVID, we all went through a cerebral amputation. 
we all wanted something back that we could not get back. We all found out how much control we actually did have. And we found out just how much oxygen left our environment. How did oxygen leave our environment? When oxygen leaves our environment, we panic. We want that next breath. The oxygen left our environment because we went and we started beating each other up over toilet paper, over soap, over hand sanitizers. That's not a normal thing to do. You do that when you're panicked. If you know, if you jump out of airplane and the parachute doesn't open up, you're going to reach for anything that's around you, even though it doesn't even make sense to yeah. grab. So we lost our oxygen out of our environment. Do we get it back because now the now we're starting to open up again? Maybe, but we're start we're also seeing mandates that are out there suit with the federal federal regulations where on planes you still got to wear the mask. My wife's a flight attendant with an airline, and you know the the escalation of people coming out of COVID now trying to be able to travel is almost out of control. People don't want to be told what to do. And, and it's the flight attendants who get the fines if they get a ride along and this person doesn't even put their mask up, won't put their tray table up, won't put their seatbelt on. They're the ones that get the fines. So what if what do we do as the traveling passengers? We panic. We start hitting people in the mouth, knocking their teeth out. We panic by saying, you can't control me at 30,000 feet. I'm going to do what I want to do. So we've still lost our oxygen out of our environment. Whatever happened during COVID where we said we're all in this together? Can wow. we have a little more of that, please? Ford, you know, Ford versus Ferrari. A little more of that, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, right? We want, we want more of that. And so we have to hold each other into account, my opinion, yeah. of, uh, of when we see something that is wrong, will our truth outweigh the fear of us getting involved? Yeah. Or will we just resolve to let that situation pass by? Oh my gosh, I just can't believe what that just happened. And go back into our cocoons and not speak up for somebody that needs to be spoken up for. Well, when you start thinking about that, and this is, we're going completely off topic of this show, but you take a look at what happened in COVID. We're all locked home. And here comes all this stuff that's happening in the world police brutality, the various things. And it all comes into focus. And, you know, your sister had a chat with me about my, I can't remember the word, racism, but the microaggressions. Hmm. And she had me read a whole bunch of books. And I didn't have any idea that I was wired like that at all, John, but my daughter did. Because she'd done the work of deep thinking. And she said, you know who needs to hear this is my dad. Because he came from a generation where it we, they took who they were for granted and got to take liberties that they shouldn't take. And so she re, had me read three or four books and actually participate in some stuff that changed my life. Hmm. And it makes me deeply sorry that I was that man. But I'm really happy for COVID and all this stuff in this perfect storm, as you just evidenced with July 4th and Juneteenth, that just have us all standing back going, holy mackerel. We yeah, can improve. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, we're all learning, right? And that's the yeah. that's the beauty of it. And, I, you know, the, the story I usually share around us learning, myself included, is when um, the, the woman comes up to me in this airport. I'm coming back from Sydney, Australia. I got my silver medal in tow, wearing an artificial leg, reading USA Today newspaper. I have my other leg beside me. And um, Which leg? The one they cut off? No, well, I, I didn't. I didn't keep that one as a suit. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> uh, maybe I should have. I wasn't in my right state of mind to, that to was a bring joke. on your show. Sorry. I wasn't Probably thinking about Tom Chanel's show. Uh, saying it. Stupid, yeah. stupid joke. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> that that just makes me hopping mad. No, okay, okay good. good. My favorite restaurants, oh, IHOP. Okay, yeah. let's get that one out. There. <laughs> um. So, so she 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 has these two boys. These two boys are you know, saying, you know, hey mom, look at this guy's legs. There's there's robot man. And you know the gateway, the people in the in the in the in the um, gate waiting area, they're saying, you know, shut them kids up. It's impolite to stare. You know, all the kind of things we say with that. And so, in the midst of that, she gets up and begins to walk in my direction. And you know, I think she's going to like the song says, "Just walk on by." <laughs> but she stops. She leans in. She says, "You know, um, my children are fascinated by your artificial leg. Uh, looks like you overcome so much adversity. You're you're such an inspiration. Could you please tell them what happened?" I'm like, 
I've never ever been, I mean, people have asked me what's going on in my leg, but never in such a public setting yeah. and bringing the two kids over. And so long story short of it, I, I do, I, I share that with them. And then when she, when they walk away after I sign an autograph for them and show them the silver medal that I just won, I hear the conversation in the gate waiting area have changed. Did you hear that story? How cool was that? Yeah. Those kids' lives will never be the same. And I'm thinking, yeah, your life is never the same anymore because you just heard that story from this woman who took a risk that came over to me against all the naysayers that were actually out there. So she opened up my aperture. How many times did I miss it by being into myself, reading my own proverbial USA Today newspapers and not dialed into somebody else who was actually seeking out information authentically, not trying to use it in some other manipulative type of way? Because we know when we're being manipulated. Um, and we also know when somebody's coming in in their true, authentic self. And so yeah. that share with me, you know, I want to open up opportunities for individuals and myself included to learn. So why is it when I go down south sometimes and I put my, you know, I give the hand the, the clerk my credit card and they just wait for me to put it onto the desk and slide it over there to them or my cash. And they they don't put it in my hand. They slide it back over to me because they don't want to touch skin. So I, I see these things reticent. Why is it I got to go across the tracks to go get the barbershop? Uh, the, all these things that are that are there. My son, he, he's um, he, he went to go see his his uh, his daughter he lives down in the state of Texas. He flew down. He's going to spend a weekend. He had a weekend off. Uh, he gets a rental car, drives over to go see her. And uh, um, they're in Midland, Odessa, Texas area. He's driving back through Uvalde after spending a great weekend with her. He's followed by 10, for 10 miles by a police officer. Ten miles. What do you do when you're followed by a police officer? You do the speed limit. Hands at 10 and 2, whatever or not, you're making sure everything's right, rear view mirror, you're checking everything. You start becoming a different person when police are following you, Absolutely. right? So it, it, we all know this. But what happens is after 10 miles, they they stop him for a lane change violation on a single lane, you know, a double lane road. So he's pulled over. Good cop, bad cop. Good cop says, you know, we turned we pulled you over for a lane lane violation. He's and um, and so we're gonna give you a warning. And so he gets the warning and, and he's and then this bad cop says, please step out of the car, sir. And John says, you know, innocently for a lane violation. And then he puts his hand on his gun, unhooks the holster and says, please step out of the car, sir. Now, most of you might be thinking, OK, oh, that happened, you know, so long ago. This happened two months ago. Yeah. Right. So this is what happens. And there's no video camera going. There's no you know, so we always think. Who are these individuals and where are the good ones that we so much hear about? Like my cousin who works in Minneapolis, who was uh, the one of the supervisors for Jarek Chauvin when wow. they were working homicide together. Or my other cousin who's working in Minneapolis, who's one of the testifiers against Derek Chauvin in the Minneapolis. So I have police officers in my family and I know how they operate, right? And they tell me the war stories and everything that's going on. So when does it happen? You know, when we talk about this Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter. Well, Blue Lives is a choice. I can choose to be a police officer or not. My cousin can be a police officer or not. He can choose that. Where I don't, I don't have a choice when I walk in the in the the room where I get pulled over. So the way John gets out of it is, the police officer bad cop says, "You know, we're from a special unit. We can search your car without any authority from anybody else." So they start rifling through his car. It's a rental car, number one. So when you run the plates, you know, I, I talked to my my friend here, my fraternity brother, who's now just was promoted to sergeant uh, in Colorado Springs. And he, he's, he says, you know, you should do a complaint on, on that down there for sure. But, you know, he, he's saying that, you know, the, the thing that he did is the right thing to stay in the back. So he stays in the back with a good cop. And he just remembers he's crossed over into Uvalde County where he went to school as in junior college. And in the summertime, he refereed basketball games. And one of the games that he refereed, you know, quite often was one of the higher ranking police officers that were was in there, like one of the chiefs of police that was there, his son. And so he just dropped his name and immediately the two officers stopped. What if he couldn't drop the name? Yeah. You know, so those are the things that happen. And we can't turn a blind eye to it just because and I'm not paying the whole police officers union bad. Yep. I'm just saying that there are these, there, there are elements that are there and how do we police ourselves? Yeah. Or do we need out external influence? Myself included. Right. So I have to be able, when I have a visceral response to something, 
Where's that coming from inside of me? So it's not to look at somebody else. Oh, it's just those individuals over there that always complain about. It. No, you have to look at why am I having this response? Because again, when the truth outweighs your fear, you'll commit to the courageous life. There you go. And what that is, when it comes in, just notice what it sticks to. Because it's sticking to something in it's your sticking to something. Oh my gosh, that's unbelievable. Well, we're going to have a little surprise for you at the break. So those of you that are listening on, on AM radio all over the world, you lost out because we've got a special guest coming in during the break because it's his birthday and he's 76 years old and he is a retired Marine and his dad. Oh, was yeah. So we're going to have some fun here during the break. So stick around. This is the Network Marketing Leadership Show with Adriani and Tom <laughs> Chenault. And we'll be right back. Thank you so much, my friends from GCN, for keeping us on the air. Get in here, Carl. No, no, you too. No, 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 no I want you. I want you. I want you. Too bad. John Collins is listening from Alaska. Get in here. <laughs> Carl, say hi to John Register. Oh, my gosh. I've been watching you for long, John. Is this the best show you've ever seen? Yeah, this is a this, this is, is a birthday. Best. This is a great birthday gift. Thank you so much, John. Happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You gotta give me the birthday shout out. Happy <laughs> birthday to ya. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday. Good. Is yes, that the best or what, Carl? Thank you. Absolutely. Don't you Devil know, dog I, in the house. I, I do. I, you know, I've been listening to this all along from the beginning, and I was thinking so many so similarities uh, between you and I. Mm. Uh, I ran hurdles in high school. Whew. I would never lead with anything but my right <laughs> leg. I wouldn't do it. I ran against the wind too, man. And, and that's just the first similarity: the military, everything like that. But I think the most important thing that I'm getting from you is the the difference that, that that's been made during this period mm -hmm. uh it's a good thing that you pointed this out from from last year from my last birthday to this birthday there has been an, uh, a, a a transformational change in me i was down and out i just came back to this country i've been away for a while i didn't know where i was going and now a, just a year later look Look at where I am now. I'm probably the happiest I've ever been in my life. Yeah. And, and this show is just, just it's leading to what, what I hear in it is uh, uh, a shift in consciousness, mm. a shift in consciousness. This is, this is coming and it's way overdue. Yeah. And I, I just want to encourage you. I'm so happy to, to touch base with you and tell you how much I appreciate this show and you. And I want to encourage you to keep, doing what you're doing because this is a great great message this is a time for a shift in consciousness i well, still have an airplane john and so we'll hey, I'll fly him down and we'll go fly around supermax and pikes peak and go for a little air you asked me like four or five years ago let's, let's go. go for a flight and Wheels i said we will one of these days we were just waiting for carl to come home from new zealand so we'll do that <laughs> i love it Oh, yeah. I, well, Carl said something that, you know, it's a shift in consciousness and I totally agree. And, and there, you know, what's happening now is that that truth is rising. And so there's, there's, you can't be a fence sitter anymore, right? Yeah. We're getting back sure. to either you agree and have to defend that or disagree and have to defend that. So I'm not saying with side, I'm just saying that there is, there's a, there's a point of, of um, embarkation that's happening right now that you have to choose kind of a, a, a side. And if you're if you don't have an opinion of if you're sitting on the fence, you're getting you know, you're getting knocked off the fence to, to choose whatever side you're going to be on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. You're going to have to make a, a decision. And, and, and it's not just you. Everybody's got to have to make a decision. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're all in this together. We're all connected. Yeah. We're all connected. We're all related. But you hit the nail on the head earlier when you were talking about your spiritual life it all boils down to love and not separation and understanding that that person over there, if you'll just take the time to know them, they've got a story that will take you to your knees, according to Brene Brown and my wife, who's watching this show and everybody just give people the benefit of the doubt. Stop being right. Start right. being loving. Right, John? Yeah. I, I, I'm laughing because, you know, uh, there, there's a script that says perfect love casts out all fear. So if you're fearful, you can't be in love. Yeah. Right. 
Right. It's, it can't, the two can't coexist. So if you're fearful, you can't be in love. So perfect love casts out all fear. So there, so, you know, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> I love it. Right. Wayne, Wayne put my, my oh, code in there. Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday, you. Carl. Thanks, Wayne Bird. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Wayne Bird's out there, yeah. Wayne Bird's out All there. right, everybody, we're back. It is the Network Marketing Leadership Show final segment. We've got John Register. By now, you've gone to johnregister.com. By now, you've Googled him. By now, you realize why we had him on. We had an agenda about talking about adversity. We didn't have the plan for this show that came in, but that's what I love about this show. There's no, you know, we never called John and said, here's what we're going to talk about. We let God drive that bus and we just showed up. And what you've done, John, is probably one of the best radio shows we've ever done. Don't you agree? 100%. And so thank you. Thank you. Lord. Thank you. We love you, man. And Jiminy Christmas. Okay. So tell everybody what you're doing now, you loser. <laughs> <laughs> so for 15 years, I worked for an incredible organization, the United States Olympic Committee, and I built out a Paralympic military sport program. This program helped wounded, ill, and injured service members use sports as a tool for the rehabilitation. So once you have kind of won the success or whatever the success is in your life, now you want to go back and help other people on that journey. So that was kind of my mission. I began to really call that piece out, and I was really engaged pretty heavily in that. That program turned into Warrior Games. It also turned into Prince Harry's Invictus Games. And I still got one more I'm trying to get. Uh, get after, and, and I won't let that cat out of the bag, but I'm, I, it, it drove me to a different direction because uh, a lot of militaries ar around the, the, the world, they don't track their veteran population. So I really wanted to begin to advocate and, and, and increase the level of honor and respect uh, for anybody who served, right? So anytime I go travel the world and I go to like a Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Japan, wherever we are, uh, I always try to visit the memorial of those countries, whether we have fought wars with each other or against each other, because everybody knows that on the battlefield, no one's really fighting for their country. They're fighting to come back home to theirs, right? That's that's what's really going on. And there's this kind of camaraderie uh, and a, between uh, brethren uh, that, and, and, and sisters that have fought in, in war. That's why Vietnam vets go back to Vietnam to try to make reparations for what's going on because there's a psych psychological thing that happens there. So I'm trying to get a hold of, uh, do that as well. So I interned my service with you, with the United States Olympic Committee after, you know, 15 years. And I went out, launched into the deep and started, uh, not started, but, but went full time with uh, Inspired Communications International, which is our professional speaking company now. And what we really do is it's really speaking, kind of training, a little bit of coaching. Um, but what the, 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 the gist of it is, is helping business professionals uh, and teach them how to hurdle their adversity, amputate their fear, embrace a new normal mindset, and we call it mind sight now, to win the medals that are in their life. And so that's what we do. We use this model from fear to freedom to help them. And we also have a championship mind sight program too, to look at the Olympic model, uh, the Paralympic model and how athletes actually train using things like uh, plus one days, the days that you're going to train that no one else will, uh, using how to manage ripples of disturbance. So COVID was a big ripple of disturbance. How do you manage around those things? Sometimes a tweet can be a ripple of disturbance that takes you off your game plan. You can put that into the business community and develop you know, how you manage the relationships to actually get you back on track faster. So that's what we help uh, businesses, business leaders do. And we've, uh, you know, we've been all around the world. It's pretty been pretty crazy. And even during COVID, we started doing it online uh, and we were doing, you know, probably almost better numbers than we did the, the first year out. So that was, uh, that's it's been fantastic. Uh, we'd love to uh, continue to work with, you know, you all and, and all, anybody else that's out there that, uh, that has a business that is looking for some, something like that to kind of inject inspiration into their company. We believe that inspiration is the catalyst to motivation. Motivation in turn causes actions. Actions lead us to transformational results. And those results, they re-inspire us or allow other people watching the process to catch their vision. That is so cool. Wow. And as you do that, who like who who are you working with right now that you're excited about pouring into to their organizations, John? Uh, great question. The next one. Is always the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well uh, but you know, we we've we've been very 
fortunate to work uh, with some, you know, from Fortune, you know, 100 companies like uh, uh, Gilead Sciences, you know, uh, American Airlines, Southwest Airlines, uh, uh, KPMG, um, you know, some of those, some of those folks, as well as some, you know, not for profits that have been out there and and an educational system. So Arkansas was one. My alma mater. We did a program with uh, University of Michigan, uh, Flint. Of uh, you know, and because they had a, a youth program that was kind of coming up, so we we kind of work with every not really everybody, but in the space of who needs either championship mindset to mindset, or they're dealing with in the, on that process of fear to freedom, that journey from fear to freedom, they're stuck someplace on there, and we offer the injection to help them get them to the jump they need to make. We can't make them jump, but we get them to the jump or create a soft landing spot after they have committed to a jump. Well, I know a couple of network marketing companies that would absolutely do a backflip to have you aboard, John. And I just want to thank you for coming on. I mean, it was very honored. It really, really was. So for people who want to connect with you, John, is your website the best place to go? Yeah. A uh, website has, uh, it's, it's the, it's the first kind of stop gap, right? So on the website, there's a video, kind of a teaser video there, uh, speaker bio video. Thanks for putting that up there on johnregister.com. And on that website also are all the social media channels that we're on upper right hand corner. You can just, you can kind of just play around. Uh, I do most of my work on LinkedIn and Instagram. Those are, those are the primary, the, the two channels I work most on. And then followed by our Facebook group, which is uh, amputatefear.com. If you want to come in there, we do a lot of little small little training. But we'll do more deeper dives in that. And then we have a show, like I said, on Thursday afternoons. We're actually interviewing an Olympian um, uh, tomorrow afternoon on my show, Hurdlers of Adversity, Conversation with Mindsight Warriors. Yeah. Wow. wow. <laughs> All right. We're out of here. Next weekend, the the price of poker is going straight down. We've got two time Emmy award winning star of general hospital real Andrews on, and he is one of the funniest, best, most ambitious leaders. Unbelievable guy. He'll be on next week. And so you want it next week. So you want to watch that show too. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you later. John, 